Welcome to the keynote podcast from Kingdom Faith. Today's message is by Pastor Colin Urquhart. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the comb. By them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Now, all kinds of words are used there. Law, statutes, precepts, commands, ordinances. But one way or another, these are all words that describe the Word. So, as you would have immediately have discerned as we read through those verses, there are 11 different ways in which the Word is described in just those few verses. So, we're going to look at those 11 things. Now, some of you are searching through to try to find the 11 things. Well, if you just listen, I'll reveal them to you. First of all, and I'm going to use not all these words like ordinances, law, and statutes, and precepts, but just the word. First of all, the word is perfect. Now, that's confirmed in other things that are said in Scripture But the Word of God is perfect. It does not need to change. Neither do we need to change it. Hello? We can explain it. We can understand it. But we cannot change it because it is perfect. This has been the real challenge to me in doing the translation, bringing out the meaning bring out the meaning without changing the word. Uh, It's quite difficult to do that when you're translating from one language to another. But nevertheless, the law or the word of God is perfect. And those who live in line with the word of God have their souls revived. So the process of revival that God wants to take his church through is to bring his people in line with his word, which is perfect. So that word is expressed in Christians' lives individually, and it's also expressed corporately in the life of the church. (coughs) So the word is perfect then it is trustworthy. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy. The more people trust in the word, the more that word is reflected in their lives. Are you there? So it's perfect, revives our souls, and the more we trust in it, the more that word is actually expressed in our lives. Therefore, the more revival takes place within our lives. Thirdly, the word is right. So, the Lord says those who believe in his word are set free and their hearts are filled with joy. Because what is right sets us free from what is wrong. Are we getting this? So when we get set free, we are filled with joy. Because anything that binds and hinders and restricts us, robs us of our joy and of our peace. So to be released from that which binds us, brings us joy. Amen. Amen. 
Then the word is light. Commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The light of revelation. It's the word that reveals the truth about God, about what he has done for us in Christ, about the inheritance that we have, about what we're able to do through faith in him. So every command shows what the Lord desires and what pleases him. We know the Lord doesn't ask us to do things, he commands us because he is the Lord. So every command he gives, he gives because that informs us of what he wants, of what he desires, of what will please him. So to obey the commands of the Lord is to please the Lord. Whereas to disobey the word of God is to displease the Lord. Because it's his perfect word. And if we've chosen to disobey, we've chosen to put something over and above God's word, which is perfect. We have replaced the perfect with something imperfect. And therefore, that does not please the Lord. Then the word encourages the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. So it encourages the fear of the Lord in this sense that we know what he wants, we know what his commands are, we know what his purpose is, we know what pleases him. And to live in the fear of the Lord is to live by doing what pleases him and not wanting to offend him by disobeying him. Are we there? So the word encourages the purity of heart so that we do not offend him. In other words, as you bring your life, your thinking, your speaking, your doing in line with God's word, so some, that is because something has happened in your heart to bring about that purity that desires his will above yours. Then the word is enduring. What does that mean? Well, it doesn't change. It's always the same. Why? Because you can't improve on the perfect. So God doesn't need to change what is already perfect. So the word is enduring. It is always true and always right, regardless of the situation. So what God wants to do is to bring the situation into line with his word because the word is right and the word is enduring. Then the word is precious. It's more precious than gold, than much fine gold. In other words, the word is precious to all those who truly love the Lord, more precious than everything else that they possess. Your Bible is your most valuable possession. That's why in countries like China, people long to possess a Bible. As many believers don't have a Bible of their own there. It is your most precious possession. Amen? It's worth more than gold. You see all these footballers and other stars making their multi-millions, but if they don't have a Bible that they are using, then you are wealthier than they are. You have something infinitely more valuable. Then the word is sweet. 
sweeter than honey, than honey from the comb. Because all those who live by the word please him, their obedience brings God's sweetness into their lives. Not harsh, not hard, not legalistic. So we're not trying to obey the word in a legalistic fashion, but we're allowing the spirit within us to actually enable that sweetness because of the obedience which we all love. Which we all love. Okay. Then the word warns us of the enemy's tactics. By them is your servant warned. By your words is your servant warned. So there are lots of warnings in Scripture. Warnings about the consequences of sin. Warnings of the consequence of disobedience. Warnings about the tactics of the enemy. And we are wise if we take heed to the warnings. It's not just a question of taking those scriptures that are sweet and nice and that we want we have to understand that God in his wisdom has given us these warnings because it's important for us to heed them. If we take heed of those warnings, then we are able to overcome sin in all its forms. Sin is deceptive, but the truth of Scripture reveals the deception and enables us to walk in the truth. Are we there? The word brings great reward. In keeping them, there is great reward. What's that? It's reward for obedience. Hallelujah. Obedience brings reward. So it's worth obeying, isn't it? The word brings great reward to those who obey what God says. Great reward for obedience. That's what the word says. In keeping them, in keeping his words, there is great reward. Anybody want a great reward? All you've got to do is to obey the word. Okay. Then... The word is to be in the mouths of his people. Verse 14, I didn't actually read. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. So his words are to be in our mouths and then they will be expressed in our lives. But this will only be the case if those words are treasured in our hearts. Because what God has done under the new covenant is to write his law on our hearts. So if we treasure the word in our hearts, then the word will be on our lips and the word will be expressed in our lives. Amen? And then we shall know the Lord as our rock and our redeemer. So those, those are our 11 things, just in those few verses we discover about the Word. It is perfect, trustworthy, always right, gives light, it encourages the fear of the Lord, it's enduring, it is precious, it is sweet, it warns us, it brings great reward, and it's always to be on our mouths and expressed in our lives. Praise God. Now, God in his infinite wisdom has given us the Holy Spirit to enable all that to happen. So the Word and the Spirit operate together in our lives. And uh, 
He is the spirit of truth, just as the word is the word of truth. And so he refines our thinking and our believing to bring it in line with the word. He refines our hearts. He continues that refining work in our lives so that we come in line with the word of God. Now turn to Matthew chapter 18. I gather some of you had a hard time when Clive talked to you yesterday in prayer school about binding and loosing. Well, what Pastor Clive told you was absolutely 100% correct, as you would expect. Nowhere in Scripture are you to release the Holy Spirit. And in fact, these verses have got nothing to do with that whatsoever. Colin, you're smiling there, so come and stand out here for a moment. Uh, let, let's just read here. Verse 18, I tell you the truth, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now let me show you what this means. If you look at the context... Jesus is actually talking about church discipline. There's nothing about the Holy Spirit. There's nothing actually intrinsically about spiritual warfare, although it does have a bearing on spiritual warfare. Now, Jesus is saying... Just hold one end there, right? Okay. It is warm up here, isn't it? Right, okay. Whatever, just stand still. Whatever you bind. Now, you have the authority to bind and therefore to restrict whatever heaven wants restricted. And we could go on and on like this. Now, that's what you do when you bind. Something that is operating that shouldn't be operating is bound. And then Jesus said, whatever is loosed, this is the loosing. You loose whatever has been bound. You don't loose the Holy Spirit. You don't loose the power of God. You loose whatever has been bound. Okay, the Greek word there means to untie, to release from bondage. And who knows, the Holy Spirit is not in bondage. He doesn't need to be released. It's the same word, the the Greek verb luo, which uh, you remember when Jesus sent the disciples to get the donkey that he was going to ride into Jerusalem. He says, untie it and bring it to me. The same word, loose it, untie it, and bring it to me. So the scripture here where it says loose, got nothing to do with I loose this, I loose that. You loose that which is bound. In the way that Jesus did. He set the captives free. So it's a verse about loosing people from captivity. So you bind those that are doing what they shouldn't do. You can bind the strong man, but you loose people from bondage. And if you look at the context, Jesus is talking about church discipline. He's not talking about prayer. He's actually talking about bringing correction into people's lives. And how, if there are people in the church, therefore, that are are causing 
disruption, they need to be bound. You need to restrict their influence. Now, when I shared the message on about Bergen and all that followed from that, you see, what I've had to do for months and months as I've prayed and, and others who've had spiritual discernment as to what was going on, we've had to keep binding. Binding people who, although they didn't realize it, inadvertently were causing a whole lot of distress because they were giving the enemy opportunity. So that activity had to be bound. And we were praying for the church to be loosed from the consequences of that activity of the enemy having entrance. And, uh, you know, I've said that since that message, a lot of people have been bringing their lives into line. There's been a lot of repentance where there have been wrong heart attitudes and people not honoring the Lord and so on. On uh, Wednesday night, we had... Clive and I had a significant meeting uh, with someone and there was a repentance that was needed in connection with this. And I was pretty strong because God had showed me that Emmeline's uh, illness was all tied up with this that at a time when a particular attack came against me and came against kingdom faith, that was when she fell ill. And so I knew that this thing had to be dealt with. A loosing had to take place. And as some of you know, uh, Pastor Jonathan Dyke, Karen and I went to right up to Lancaster, which is way up, that's by the Lake District there, to see Emmeline on Sunday. Now, what she told us was interesting. This release came on Wednesday night, right? She told us that in the early part of last week, on Wednesday, her whole stomach area was swollen and she was, it was so painful she could not even touch it with her hand. And at that time the doctors were fearful that all kinds of nasties were all over various parts of her body internally. Thursday, her stomach returned to normal, and she could press it and prod it and poke it without any pain, and, and all the symptoms of what was going on inside had disappeared. Some pastors came and anointed her that day, and she felt better, and when we prayed with her on Sunday, she said, I feel so well now, I just want to get up and discharge myself. Now, you see... That is a good example of what loosing means. A spiritual loosing had to happen in the body. It has been happening, but there was still this element which was just giving the enemy a foothold. That element had to be dealt with when it was dealt with then immediately that healing for which we have been praying for weeks could take place. There had to be the loosing that would enable that healing to happen. And you see, it wasn't a loosing over her life. 
It was a loosing in the body. And this is, this is where we often don't appreciate that what goes on in your life affects the body. You might not realize that, but spiritually it affects the body. Your disobedience weakens the body. Your disobedience to God can actually give the enemy access, not just in your life, but in the body. Are we getting this and understanding it? So this is what this binding and loosing is all about. So in the whole of... uh, I, I did a quick word study early this morning about the Holy Spirit. Now just, just listen to this. This is a survey of what it says in the New Testament about the Holy Spirit. And you'll see there's nothing about releasing the Holy Spirit. Listen. Uh, my Spirit leads. He sends. He moves people. He gives power. People are born of the Spirit. He, the Holy Spirit, gives birth to their spirits. He gives His Spirit without limit. We are to worship in Spirit. The Spirit gives life. The Word is Spirit and life. He is the Spirit of truth who guides us into all the truth. He gives gifts. He is the spirit of holiness. We serve in the new way of the spirit. You live according to the spirit. You set your mind on what the spirit desires. The spirit brings life and peace. By the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body. He is the spirit of sonship. He helps you in your need. He intercedes for you. He brings unity among God's people. He pours his love into our hearts. He searches all things and brings revelation. He is the spirit of wisdom. People are baptized in the spirit. He gives us ministry in the power of the spirit. He is the Spirit, and He brings freedom wherever He is. He is the deposit who guarantees our inheritance. He is given by God. He is the Spirit of Christ. He brings brings desires that are contrary to the flesh. He produces the fruit of the Spirit in believers. He is the Spirit of wisdom and revelation. He gives people access to the Father and the Son. People are to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Word of God is the sword of the Spirit. We are to pray in the Spirit on all occasions. The Spirit enables us to stand firm. We can enjoy the fellowship of the Spirit. He sanctifies God's people and brings vindication of the truth. He reveals the will of God. He is the Spirit of power, love, and right thinking. He is the eternal Spirit, the Spirit of grace, the Spirit of faith, the Spirit of glory. He brings God's word to the church, he encourages faith for Christ's return. Nothing about release of the Spirit. Why? Because God is the only one who can release the Spirit. The Spirit will do what God tells him to do, not what we tell him to do. Are we getting this? So if some of you were shocked, it's because before you were wrong. And none of us 
likes to admit maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> so what do we mean when we say, I release this and I release that? Well, it all depends what's going on inside you. You see, when I preach, I want God to release the spirit of wisdom and revelation, to release the spirit of faith. But I can't do that. He can do that. I believe that he will do that. Lord, I believe that you release the spirit of wisdom and revelation over the meeting today. That's what I pray when I'm going to preach. Lord, I, I believe you release the spirit of faith so faith will rise up within people as they hear the word. But I can't dictate to the spirit what it's to do, but I believe that God will cause his spirit to do that work. Loosing, release, everywhere, everywhere that the word release is used in the New Testament, it is to untie or to unbind. It's never to release the purposes of God. Ever. Now, where the Spirit of God is, there is freedom. Why? Well, the Spirit directs us to the Word, and the Word enables us to bind what needs to be bound and to untie what needs to be untied so there can be freedom. We have the authority to do that. Now, those verses in uh, Matthew 18, you see, are about the church. Let's, let's just have a look at the context. Verse 15, we'll start to. If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. <clears throat> but if he will not listen, take one or two others along, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. I tell you, whatever you bind on earth. So if there's somebody that's causing all this problem, all these problems, you bind him. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosened in heaven. And whoever you untie from the bondage that they're in, they will be released. Why? Because, you see, in heaven, everything that is not of God has been bound. And in heaven, everything that is of God is released, is loosed, is untied. Amen? So again, I tell you, if any two... Uh, are, if two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, it will be done for you. Now, there you see... It's not for us to release the Spirit. It's for us to agree in faith. And then God will release the whole situation. And this is the, the other context in which uh, Jesus uses... You can turn back to chapter 16. He's talking to Peter. Peter. Verse 18, I tell you that you are Peter on this rock, meaning himself. I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now that seems to be the same, doesn't it? But it isn't. Because in chapter 16, the you is in the singular. He is talking to Peter. In chapter 18... The you is in the plural. He's talking to all the disciples. Hello? So he is giving Peter this principle about the kingdom. What is he saying? He is saying, you have the authority to bring everything in line with my rule and reign. So what is not in line with my rule and my reign, you can bind, you can restrict. But you can release whatever needs to be released as evidence that this kingdom is present, just like Jesus did. 
You see, all the, uh, in John's gospel, all the, the miracles, the healings that Jesus performed were signs. And even in the other gospels, they were signs of the presence of the kingdom. So why is there so much sort of belief among Christians that this is all about spiritual warfare, you know, binding and loosing? Well, it's ignorance, that's all. That if you actually get into the Greek and, and get into what the scripture means, then it's very, very clear. So you can talk about release. You can say, yes, loosing means release, so long as you understand it's releasing from being bound. It's releasing that which has been tied up, so it's set free. Are you breathing? So that which needs to be restricted, you have the authority to restrict. That which needs to be untied, you have the authority to untie. That's the authority that we've given. Been, we've been given. So <clears throat> we do need to bind the strong man so that we can then plunder his goods. But you don't bind the strong man to release the spirit, you bind the strong man to plunder his goods. So he cannot prevent you from setting people free. He cannot hinder that which you are doing in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Some of you are still looking a bit surprised. Now, is there any sense then in which we can release the Spirit only by believing God. Every time we believe God's Word, which we've just been talking about, the Spirit is released. And Jesus knew that. You will receive whatever you ask in prayer if you believe. Why? Because when you believe, the Spirit gets released. But you don't release the Spirit. God releases the Spirit in response to your faith. So if you go back to chapter 18, if any two of you agree concerning anything, it will be done. Why? Because if there's a, that's agreement in faith. If you agree in faith, then... Whoosh, God releases the situation in whatever way it needs to be released. And if that involves releasing his spirit into the situation, he will do that. Are we understanding this? So it's fine, you see, by faith to say, Lord, I believe you release the spirit of revelation. Lord, I believe you release the spirit of faith into the meeting. Lord, I believe that you release the spirit of healing over the meeting. But actually, God has to do that. The Holy Spirit is not your puppy dog for you to tell him what to do. The Father and the Son command the Holy Spirit. It's like angels. You know, I hear sometimes people commanding angels. You've got no right to command angels. Only God has the right to command angels. You can ask God to command his angels to help you. But he is the only one who actually tells the angels what to do. Are we getting this? I think just about every year we come around to this at some point and have to get it all clarified in our thinking. Now, sometimes, you see, when we're praying, our language gets a bit loose. Uh, it's very easy to pray without getting your doctrine right, actually. And God doesn't worry too much about that because he answers your heart. He answers the prayer of your heart. So even if you get it wrong in the way in which you're expressing it, 
God understands what you mean. God understands what you intend. And God understands what you believe. Mm -hmm. But there is so much misunderstanding of this, this whole business, especially in those with sort of deliverance ministries who want to see everything in terms of, of spiritual warfare. And it is a kind of spiritual warfare because if you're unbinding people, if you're loosing them in that sense, that is spiritual victory. I don't like a phrase spiritual warfare. I much prefer spiritual victory. Because as far as I'm concerned, the war is won. It's just that we're sort of tidying up all the skirmishes that need to be finished before Jesus comes again. But the enemy's on the run. I said the enemy's on the run. So praise God. I think many of us, when we pray, probably will say things like, I lose the spirit of this, that, and the other. And, you know, God, God doesn't sort of get in a huff about it. He knows that's his job, not your job. But he looks at the heart, you see, and sees what you believe. Do you really believe that he will release his spirit into that situation? Do you really believe that that situation is going to be resolved? The three of us, when we were traveling up to Lancaster to, to see Emily, we knew that God was going to heal her before we ever got there. And all the family were there, and they all knew that she was going to be healed before we got there. There was, there was just this, well, this is it. God has cleared all the other stuff out of the way, and this is it. So we're expecting her. <laughs> I mean, you know, when you're in the hands of the medical profession, they will want to make sure everything is right. But that's okay. They'll soon see everything is right. Amen. We have a great God. But I trust that when Pastor Clive was speaking yesterday, none of you said, I don't agree. Because do you remember? That's the first seed of rebellion. when you hear something that's brought us revelation and it comes up against your thinking that's the time to go to prayer not say I don't agree Lord revelation is being brought here about your word and meaning of the word which comes right up against my understanding just guide me into the truth But you don't sit there and say, don't agree with that. No. <coughs> Not that any of you would. <laughs> hmm? Because what is it all about at present? Honoring God. Honoring his word. Honoring the Spirit. Honoring the anointing. All about honor. Praise God. So... The Holy Spirit does not cooperate with us. We cooperate with the Holy Spirit. If we do what the Spirit tells us to do, we will take the life and the power and the victory of Jesus 
into every situation. It is not for us to control the Spirit, but for the Spirit to control us. So if I'm praying, laying hands on someone to be healed, I believe that God is releasing his healing power into that person's life. Why? Because I'm praying with faith. So I can say, in the name of Jesus, I release the healing power of Jesus into your life now. Why? Because I know he's honoring faith. So, you know, the folks in Chester say, oh, I hear you've got to go up and visit one of your people in Lancaster when they're finished. So they said, well, we're not going to visit her. We're going to heal her. (laughs) Because there's a big difference, isn't there? If you go to visit, you take flowers and grapes. But if you're going to heal, (laughs) you just take the anointing. (laughs) So we had no flowers or grapes. We talked about it on the way up and realized, no, wait a minute, we're taking her healing. And that's much better than flowers or grapes. Flowers or grapes presume that she's going to stay there. Healing means she's going to get out of there. So actually, when we got there, we were given the grapes. Hallelujah. (laughs) It's true. No flowers, but we were given the grapes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So God is good, isn't he? Yes. So you see, what, what he does in, in all these kind of ways is bring our thinking in line with his word. And then as we believe his word and apply his word, we walk in that word, we see the release of the life of which the word speaks. So there's nothing wrong in, in using the word release. We don't have to get it all in a, uh, a tiswas about this. When people get baptized in the Holy Spirit, it is as if the Holy Spirit gets released in their lives. Now, nowhere in the New Testament does baptism in the, is baptism in the Holy Spirit described as a release of the Spirit. It's an immersion or an inf- being infused with the Spirit. It brings power and all kinds of other things into our lives. It doesn't talk about the release of the Holy Spirit. But ever since I've known people to be baptized in the Spirit, people have often talked about the Spirit being released in their lives. Why? Because... That's what the experience seems to indicate. You know, you might have been a Christian for some time before, you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, and suddenly the Spirit of God is released in your life. That's the experience. But the Spirit, you, 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 you feel that, you sense that, you experience that, Because what God has done is to completely infuse you with the Spirit and now rivers of living water are pouring out of you as they were not before. So it seems that you are released. It seems that the Spirit is released in your life. It seems that things are pouring out now. So there's no no, uh, offense to God if we use that word just so long as we understand that it's simply the activity of the Holy Spirit overflowing out of our lives. That's what is actually happening, scripturally speaking. So praise God. You uh, don't have to be a Greek scholar. Clive doesn't know Greek. But He is wise enough when he's teaching about anything to go to the word book. They're all in your library then. And to look up, well, what does that word mean in Scripture? Uh, 
And that word loose does mean to unbind. It actually can mean to destroy. In the sense that you destroy what was binding the person. You don't destroy the person, but you destroy, you, you unbind and destroy what was binding them. Well, you can't unbind the Holy Spirit and destroy the Holy Spirit. Hello? <laughs> so, <clears throat> we now understand, don't we? Yes. Amen? Amen? And we all agree. Yes. This is the agreement of faith. So we can know that as we come together, if any two agree concerning anything, God will bring his release into the situation. And where any two or three are gathered together in faith, if we gather together in his name, we're gathered together by faith and dependence upon his name. There he is in the midst. Well, if he is in the midst of us, why do you think you've got to do the releasing? Wouldn't it be better for him to do it? Why is he there? Just to spectate and see how you're getting on? No, he's saying, if there is that agreement of faith, if you come together, there am I, so that I will be active in response to your prayer and in response to what you're doing. Amen? Isn't it better to leave it to him? Yes. Praise God. Okay, let's all stand. Now, because the words, whatever you bind, whatever you loose in chapter 18, are plural, they're addressed to you. So I want you to thank the Lord that you have the authority to bind, to restrict whatever heaven does not permit. If it's not permitted in heaven, you have the authority to bind it up, to restrict it, and to prevent it on earth. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We praise you, Lord. Now, thank the Lord that when any two of you agree concerning that, then it is bound, it is restricted. It is hindered from having the harmful effect that the enemy intends. So just give him glory for that. Hallelujah. That's the authority you have. Now thank the Lord that you have the authority to unbind. To loose situations and people that are bound up. Whosoever sins you forgive, they are forgiven. You have the authority to release people from the bondage of sin. You have the authority to release them from the bondage to the enemy. Because there's no enemy in heaven now. Hallelujah, he got kicked out. Come on, thank the Lord you have that authority. Other people are going to come into the freedom of the Spirit because you exercise your authority to untie them in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 
Rostacaria, Zataria, Lero, Bacara, Sitri, Santo, Paloto, Pacorosuto. Brostacaria, Sitri, Sataria, Lero, Bacara, Sitri, Santo. Thank you, Lord. Now thank the Lord for his word. That his word is perfect. Hallelujah. Just tell him that you want your life to come in line with his word. Thank him that he's reviving your soul as more and more of that word impacts your life. That process of reviving is going on all the time. Thank him for that. Thank him that his word is trustworthy. Hallelujah. You can always trust what God says. And you can thank him that he is faithful in fulfilling that word. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, mighty God. Thank him that the word is right and that those who believe are set free and their hearts are filled with joy. So thank the Lord that every time you believe his word, more freedom comes into your life. That the truth sets you free. Hallelujah. And fills you with joy. Praise you, Lord. Now thank the Lord that the word brings the light of revelation into your life. Thank him that every command shows what pleases him. And therefore because you love him, you want to please him by obeying his commands. Hallelujah. Just tell the Lord that. Lord, I want my life to be right in line with your word. Oh, I praise you. I bless you. I thank you, Lord. Praise your wonderful name. Hallelujah. And thank you, Lord, that your word says the more we please you, the greater we are blessed. And so thank you, Lord, that as we please you, so you give back to us. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over is poured into our laps. And we give you all the glory, Jesus. Hallelujah. Now thank him that his word encourages the fear of the Lord in your life. Hallelujah. Oh, that you do not want to offend him. That the word encourages purity in your heart. So that you desire what he desires. And you want to please him and and honor him in all things. Hallelujah. Oh, we praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And thank him that the word is enduring. It doesn't change. It's always true. No matter what the circumstances. No matter what you feel. Hallelujah. No matter what others do. No matter what others say. The word is always enduring. It is always true. It is always life. It is always spirit. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And thank him that he's bringing more and more of your life in line with that enduring word. Thank him that his word is precious, more precious than gold. Thank him that your Bible is your most precious possession apart from the Holy Spirit living in you. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Satu pogra zata pakara zituri satu. Brota paria zata bala zituri saratu pokara zitapa. Thank him that by that word you know his will. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Now thank him that the word is sweet. Bring sweetness into your life. That the more your life lines up with the word, the more of that sweetness, the more of that precious ointment. You are the sweet fragrance of God. 
in the world. Come on, thank him for that. It's wonderful. It's that obedience that brings sweetness into your life. Thank him. Thank him that by his grace you are enabled to obey him. And the Spirit is all the time encouraging that obedience. Urging you to obey. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Now thank Him that He warns you through His Word of the enemy's tactics. He warns you of what is not right. He warns you of what will bring you into bondage. Come on, give Him glory. Give Him honor. Give Him praise. I thank Him that the Word brings great reward. Hallelujah. Great reward to those who obey. Great reward for obedience. Thank Him that as you obey that Word, your reward increases. That there is that reward now and there's that eternal reward that is stored up for you in heaven. You're laying up for yourselves treasure in heaven. Hallelujah. Come on, give Him glory. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. So thank Him that His Word is in your heart and on your lips. So you speak the truth of His Word over your life. Hallelujah. Thank Him, therefore, that that Word is going to be reflected in your life, in your relationships, in your activities, in the way you minister to others. Praise you, Lord. Thank you for listening to this Kingdom Faith podcast. We trust it's been an encouragement to you. For more information and resources by Kingdom Faith and for our other audio and video podcasts, please visit kingdomfaith.com.